Roger, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. Roger, roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, no problem. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the May 27, 2020 edition of Space News. This is Peter Ailed, and tonight I'm joined by Tina Stagg and Michael Abdill, and we're all from the Space Association of Australia. Let's get the show started with some Australian Space News debris from what is believed to be a Russian rocket re entered Earth's atmosphere, delivering a light show across the skies in parts of Victoria and Tasmania on Friday evening. The light show was not a shooting star or a meteor, but a rocket returning to Earth, Astronomical Society of Victoria Vice President Perry Vlahos said. The fact it was slow moving and at a shallow angle and an amount of disintegration was occurring gave it away as not being an alien spacecraft, a meteor or a comet, he said. It's a late stage Russian rocket that put up a satellite about 5.30 our time this afternoon. So that spent rocket stage was re-entering the atmosphere. The Soyuz 2-1B rocket launched from the Placensk Cosmodrome on Friday morning, carrying a satellite designed to give notice to Russia of missile attacks. Debris burned up on re-entry and none of it would have hit the ground, Laho said. And it's over to you, Tina. Thanks, Peter, and good evening, space fans. Looking at the International Space Station, Japan launched a cargo spacecraft to the International Space Station last week. An H-2B rocket lifted off from the Tanegashima Space Centre and placed the HTV-9 cargo spacecraft into orbit 15 minutes later. The spacecraft, carrying several tonnes of equipment and supplies, was due to arrive at the station on Monday. The cargo includes the Space Frontier Studio Kibo, which will be installed in the Japanese Kibo module in the station. The studio, a partnership between the Japanese space agency JAXA and Japanese digital entertainment firm Bascule, includes a screen that will be installed next to a window in the module. The screen will show pictures and messages from people on Earth and an astronaut will capture video of both the display and the view out the window to transmit back to Earth. And in NASA news, the head of NASA's human spaceflight programs, Doug Levero, has abruptly resigned over what he calls a mistake. NASA announced last week that Lavero resigned as Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations after less than six months on the job. The agency did not disclose the reason for the resignation, but Lavero himself said in a memo that he took an unspecified risk that had consequences for him. It is clear that I made a mistake in that choice for which I alone must bear the consequences, he said. The issue appears to involve some aspect of Artemis program procurement and not the commercial crew program. The timing of the resignation, a little more than a week before the SpaceX Demo 2 commercial crew launch, surprised many and raised questions about the agency. Oklahoma Democrat Representative Kendra Horn, chair of the House Space Subcommittee, said she was deeply concerned about the resignation and said, we need answers. And to NASA's commercial crew program, the astronauts who will fly the SpaceX commercial crew test flight scheduled for 6.33 a.m. tomorrow arrived in Florida last week. NASA astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley arrived at the Kennedy Space Center for final preparations, including a walkthrough of pre-launch activities and final checks of their pressure suits and the Crew Dragon spacecraft. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine and KSC Director Bob Cabana greeted them but observed coronavirus protocols such as physical distancing and wearing masks. And the Demo-2 mission will return a flag to Earth left on the station by the last shuttle mission. But astronauts needed to find the flag first, it has been revealed. The flag, which also flew on the first shuttle mission, was left on the ISS by the final shuttle crew with the intent that the first commercial crew mission would return it. However, the flag was lost for a time on the station when it was placed in a cargo bag. 
In 2018, NASA astronaut Scott Tingle, then on the station, was asked to track down the flag, which he was able to do only after weeks of searching and calls with astronauts who had previously been on the station. And to NASA's Artemis program, and the agency will ask countries seeking to cooperate on the program to follow a series of principles for safe behaviour in space. The agency has unveiled the Artemis Accords, which cover principles such as affirming exploration for peaceful purposes, protecting Apollo and other landing sites on the moon, and establishing safety zones around sites where NASA or partners are conducting activities. Agency officials said the Accords were intended to implement obligations from the Outer Space Treaty and other space treaties, as well as codify norms of behaviour. NASA will execute the Accords through a series of bilateral agreements with countries that want to cooperate on any aspect of the Artemis program other than the Lunar Gateway, which will be governed by an extension of the intergovernmental agreement used for the International Space Station. To NASA's planetary and space science programs, and a NASA mission is delaying plans to capture a sample from the surface of an asteroid. The OSIRIS REx mission was scheduled to perform a touch and go manoeuvre on the surface of the asteroid Bennu in August, collecting samples for later return to Earth. NASA said last week that it is pushing back that sample collection attempt until October, saying the coronavirus pandemic had slowed its planning efforts. The delay will not affect the spacecraft schedule for leaving the asteroid next year, returning the samples to Earth in 2023. And in US military news, an Atlas V successfully launched a military space plane last week. The Atlas V in the 401 configuration lifted off from Cape Canaveral and placed the X-37B into orbit after weather delayed the launch by a day. The X-37B, flying a mission called OTV-6 by the Air Force, is carrying several US military and NASA experiments. One of the experiments is a photovoltaic radio frequency antenna module from the Naval Research Lab that will test converting power generated by a solar panel into microwaves that can be transmitted. The technology is critical to long-running aspirations for space-based solar power that is beamed down to Earth. If the experiment is successful, it could lead to a dedicated satellite mission to test the transmission of energy back to Earth. The Air Force has not disclosed how long the X-37B will remain in orbit for this mission, but past missions have lasted up to two years. And thank you, Tina. Let's look at India. Indian astronaut candidates have resumed training in Russia. Four Indian Air Force pilots went to the Russian Cosmonaut Training Centre in Star City earlier this year as India prepares to carry out its first crewed spaceflight by 2022. Training was interrupted in late March by the coronavirus pandemic and the pilots were locked down at the training centre. Russian space company Glavkosmos said last week that the training had resumed. Meanwhile, the Indian government has announced reforms to support the country's commercial space industry. As part of a larger package of changes intended to support the nation's economy, The government said it would allow companies to use space agency facilities for development and testing and open up future government projects to greater participation by the private sector. The government released few details about how and when those reforms would be enacted. But K. Sivan, the head of the Indian space agency ISRO, said he would very soon provide specifics such as determining what excess capacity exists at ISRO facilities and the cost for making that available to companies. And looking at Japan, the Japanese military has formally established a unit devoted to space operations. 
the Space Operations Squadron, part of the Japan Air Self-Defense Force, is charged with protecting Japanese satellites from both orbital debris and potential attack. The unit will start with a staff of 20 people and will grow to 100 by 2023. And turning to commercial news, a static fire test of a SpaceX Starship prototype last week appears to have gone awry. The SN4 Starship vehicle, mounted on a test stand at the company's Boca Chica test site, fired its single Raptor engine for a few seconds. However, flames were visible around the base of the vehicle after the engine shut down. Road closures normally lifted after the completion of a test remained in place, suggesting crews may have been having problems safing the vehicle after the test. SpaceX was preparing to perform a low-altitude hop test of the vehicle in the near future, although the FAA has yet to publish a new or revised experimental permit needed for the flight. And staying with SpaceX, the company's next Starlink mission has been delayed. The company said the launch will be postponed until after the Demo 2 commercial crew mission has launched. The launch was originally scheduled for earlier this month, but was delayed when the X-37B Atlas V launch, also from Cape Canaveral, slipped by a day. Then, Tropical Storm Arthur created unfavourable conditions in the booster landing zone in the Atlantic Ocean, forcing SpaceX to postpone the launch and instead focus on the Demo-2 mission. Meanwhile, satellite operators say SpaceX's rideshare program is pushing down launch prices. The Rideshare program offers low-cost SmallSat launch options on both dedicated launches as well as Starlink missions. Planet, which will launch six SkySat satellites on two Falcon 9 missions through the program, called the pricing incredibly competitive, forcing other launch providers to offer similar pricing or otherwise get more creative in their services. And back to you, Peter. Thank you, Michael. And let's uh, have a look at Ariane Space. The first launch of the Ariane 6 is now unlikely to take place this year. A European Space Agency official said the coronavirus pandemic had slowed or stopped three development projects related to the rocket, including qualification tests of the solid rocket boosters. Ariane Space had hoped to make a first Ariane 6 launch in the fourth quarter of this year but acknowledged even before the pandemic that the schedule was very tight. And over to Virgin Galactic, billionaire Richard Branson has started to sell his Virgin Galactic shares. The company reported that Branson's holding company, Vico10, sold 2.6 million shares valued at $41 million earlier this month. As reported here recently on Space News, Branson is working to raise money to finance some of his other ventures like Airline Virgin Atlantic, that are in distress because of the economic effects of the coronavirus pandemic. And over to SpaceX and NASA. SpaceX and NASA will fly graduation photos for the class of 2020. US high school and college graduates unable to participate in physical graduation ceremonies this year because of the coronavirus pandemic can instead upload graduation photos to SpaceX's website. A mosaic of those images will be flown on the Demo 2 mission scheduled to launch this week. And finally tonight, Annie Glenn, widow of the late US Senator and astronaut John Glenn, has died at the age of 100. Glenn died of complications from COVID-19 at a nursing home in Minnesota last week. Annie Glenn first rose to national prominence after her depiction in the 1983 film The Right Stuff and then during her husband's unsuccessful presidential campaign which followed in 1984. Annie was an advocate for people with disabilities and communication disorders. A stutterer from an early age herself, 
Glenn was notable for raising awareness of stuttering among children and adults, as well as other disabilities. In 1983, Glenn received the first National Award of the American Speech and Hearing Association for her meritorious service to those with communicative disorders. John Glenn, most famous for his Mercury Friendship 7 mission, the first orbital flight by an American astronaut, passed away in 2016. A memorial service for Annie Glenn to be held online because of the pandemic is scheduled for June the 6th. And that's it for this week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael and Tina, and we'll speak to you again next week. Bye now.